Photography, whether we do it as a hobby or a job, is a creative process. We talk about it with the same artistic terms that we do painting, light, structure, form, balance, intent, etc. Yet, like painting, it's equally a technical discipline, one that has grown significantly more complex since the advent of digital photography and more specifically since the arrival of the RAW format. And at the very core of the RAW final format is demosaicing, the crucial intermediate process that bridges the initial capture of your photograph in a digital camera with its eventual display in your editing app screen. The word demosaicing, and indeed the process it describes, is a complete mystery to many photographers, which is not ideal because it's literally the foundation of the entire post-processing workflow. Is it the word itself? Does the fact that it has five syllables in it put people off? I think we need to get to the bottom of this. So friends, if demosaicing is one of those phrases your brain just cheerfully skips over like terms and conditions or read manual before assembly, then buckle up space cowboys and cowgirls. I speak fluent geek and I'm happy to translate. At its heart, the raw photo file format is a really simple idea. It was invented in 1991 by Kodak as a way of attracting professional photographers to the digital camera arena by giving them more control over their digital photographs. The concept was that instead of using the weedy little processor inside a camera to jazz up the image before saving it into the SD card as a JPEG, Photographers would have access to the unaltered, unedited, unprocessed digital information recorded by the sensor at the moment the photo was taken. Basically, all that binary data, the ones and zeros, are dumped unmolested into a single file. There are several different kinds of sensors in cameras and they work in slightly different ways, but the central concept is this. There are little pixels called photosites, which record the brightness levels of light. Most cameras, Sony, Nikon, Canon, Panasonic, Olympus, Leica, Pentax, and Hasselblad, have what is called a Bayer sensor. And they use microscopic 2x2 two two grids of pixels which record red, green, or blue color information. And those 2x2 two two grids sit right on top of the light-sensitive pixels. So when a light is shone on the sensor at the moment of capturing a photograph, the photons pass through a color pixel and then down onto the light sensitive pixel and the color and brightness levels are recorded in the raw file. The problem with this sensor design is that each pixel is not getting all of the color information, it's only getting the color that happens to be directly above it. Just red or just green or just blue. I'm sure you've spotted the problem by now. The information required to reconstruct the scene digitally is incomplete. If the red pixel is exposed to blue sky, it won't record any color information because it's only sensitive to red, for example. The result is that heaps of color information is missing. Can you guess what the process of working out what the missing color values is called? I'll take digital photography for $200, please, Alex. The answer? This computational process transforms the checkerboard of red, green, and blue pixels from a camera's raw sensor data into a full color image. What is demosaicing? Correct. Yes, demosaicing is the process of guessing those missing color values. If you save out as a JPEG to your SD card, then the camera is doing the demosaicing. But if you save as a RAW, then the RAW editor on your PC or Mac will try and fill in the gaps and calculate values for the missing color information. So when I said that this process was the foundation of the whole post-processing workflow, I really wasn't kidding. 
If the demosaic encode in one app does a better job of guessing those color values than the code in another app, then the image is going to look better, or at least more accurate. If an app does a bad job demosaicing, then you might notice defects in the image, such as color fringing, eye effects, jagged lines, and noise. Many Fuji users swore off Adobe Lightroom in the past because the demosaicing engine used to add worm eye facts to their images. To complicate matters further, not all cameras use the 2x2 grid style Bayer sensor. Most notably, Fujifilm used their own X-Trans sensor, which uses a more complex 6x6 grid, which results in 36 pixels in each unit, rather than the four you get in a Bayer sensor. And as this added complexity explains why some raw editor developers simply ignore Fujifilm altogether, they can't justify dedicating extra development hours to what represents just 7% of the global camera market. So by now, I'm pretty sure you'll agree that the software you use to decode or demosaic your raw files is important. Not all raw editors are created equal. Some of them do a better job of demosaicing raw files than others. They do a better job with the colors, with the noise, and with the dynamic range. Hold up, more jargon. Let's talk about dynamic range briefly, because it's a core part of pre-processing and can have a direct impact on the quality of your photograph too. Dynamic range is the gap between the brightest visible part of an image and the darkest visible part. Good demosaicing code will find more detail in the highlights and the shadows that would otherwise be lost completely. You can see this quite clearly when you open a RAW file in a RAW editor and enable the clipping indicators. Here's an example to show you what I mean. In this photograph, there are portions of the photo that are so overexposed that there is no pixel information at all they show up as an off-gray color in Lightroom. It doesn't matter how far I dial back the exposure on this photo or pull back the highlights, there is no color or light information to be displayed. Lightroom's demosaicing engine declares those pixels missing in action. Both Capture One and DxO Photo Lab did a better job than Lightroom at finding information in those blown out highlights but DxO did the best job, giving me pixel information for nearly all the blown out portions of the photo. So, chop another one up to Photo Lab? Not quite. You see, there's another app that takes a different approach to this demosaicing, and based on what I've learned so far, it's probably the most powerful of them all. The app I'm referring to is called Darktable, and unlike the other raw editors I mentioned, it just so happens to be completely free. I should also warn you that it's probably the least user-friendly app I've ever used, with a fiendishly complicated feature set, a weird ask-first workflow, and an interface constructed with zero deference to usability. The fundamental difference between Darktable and an app like Lightroom or Capture One lies in the processes that occur as you load that raw photo file. Traditional raw editors use what's called a display referred workflow, and Darktable has what's called a scene referred workflow. Yep, more jargon, but the important words are display and scene. With Lightroom or Capture One's display referred workflow, the apps compress the raw image data to look good on your monitor, hence display. The apps do the usual magic with the demosaic of the raw image color data, and then they tweak luminosity levels to better suit your screen, even before you get to edit it. They do that second bit by using a tone curve, which is simply a graph of brightness values. The long and the short of it is this. You're working with a compromised image from the very beginning, one in which some important raw data, specifically brightness levels, is discarded. The practical result of this is that there will be parts of the raw image data that you cannot recover even though they exist in the original photo data, because the light levels are being squished down to display better on your screen. With me so far? 
cool. Then we have the scene referred workflow in Darktable. And this is where things get a bit trippy. Darktable keeps all of the raw data fully intact by keeping the image as it is in the real world, the scene in other words, rather than the display. Because it's not sticking a tone curve on the image right at the start, all of that extra raw information is at your disposal. And you can do all your regular post-processing using that extra data and only compress it once you're done right at the end of the pipeline, not right at the start. The practical result of this is that you can recover far more information from either end of the dynamic range, from the shadows and from the highlights. Furthermore, since scene-referred workflows use more realistic colors, any changes you make to brightness will not cause the same sort of strange color shifts you spend so long managing in apps like Lightroom and Capture One. I've been trying to get a grip with Darktable for several months now, and I still find it about as welcoming as a bed full of cold sick. But the results are hard to ignore. If you're prepared to basically relearn your entire raw processing workflow, then you get rewarded with the most complete version of the photo you took when you press that shutter button. As photographers, we spend an inordinate amount of time obsessing over the hardware we use to shoot photographs. The cameras, the lenses, the filters. But when it comes to processing our digital photos, we tend to pick one app and then stick with it through thick and thin. Given how important a reliable and effective demosaicing algorithm is to the whole process, this reliance on one app seems misguided. I think we should be placing far more emphasis on what happens long before we move a single slider. And that'll do us for this look at demosaicing and its crucial place in the digital photography workflow. Have you ever given a second thought to it? Or do you just go along with the received wisdom about apps? Let me know in the comments section down below. If you got value from this video, then do please give it a like and consider subscribing to my channel for more photo, video and a drone related content from me. Till the next time, guys. Ta-ta.